So hello, my name's Matt Renard. I'm interviewing you a part of my because of my Max Potential program and out of school uh, leadership program. And one of my parts of the program I have to do is a community service project where I have to uh, help the community out in a certain way. And I thought that it would be appropriate to do a drugs and alcohol and reckless behaviour um, educational program. And um, so today I'm with uh, Dr. Gordian Forder, and I'm just so I've got a couple of questions here lined up. So. Sure. Um, question one. So, what was your career pathway into becoming director of emergency at St Vincent's Hospital? It's like all these things. Uh, you can have choice, but the, it also is chance and things. I mean, uh, my parents were doctors, my wife's a doctor, and as a little kid, I must have been a brat, as a little kid, even less than 10 years old, I knew what I wanted to do. And obviously, my parents or whatever, I wanted to be a doctor. I actually wanted to be a GP surgeon in the town, a small, not very popular town, near where we had our Christmas holidays always. That's mm -hmm. whatever. And uh, number two, I was going to be a carpenter. And number three, I was going to be, get ready for it, a long distance truck driver, listening to and singing country and western songs. <laughs> that, there, there you go. But anyway, and obviously it's so hard, you've got to be so lucky to get into medicine, etc., uh, etc., et uh, and things. Uh, but... Uh, and then, so I became a surgeon. I actually worked in the country for a while. Uh, and then there was a death in the family, etc., etc. And my wife found a, a job where I was a surgeon. There's a Southern Hospital here. I was a surgeon and also had to look after the emergency department. In those days, the emergency department was called CAS. It was really the pits of the hospital. And there was really no structured way or organised way to look after the patients. It was the last man out, basically... Whatever, it was really d regarded as a place you really don't want to be. Uh, and I was part of reshaping all that and emergency medicine, and I realised that was what I really then and still care for. So uh, which cross-sections of the community do you usually see in the emergency department? I can only say St Vincent's emergency is unique in the world. People say that sort of stuff, don't they? But it really is. I've travelled the world, all that sort of stuff. And nobody comes close to because in Australia we're so lucky. We have an ambulance service, and a very good ambulance service, and they've got to take patients from a certain catchment. So it's a geographic thing. Your ambulance service is under the Department of Health, and we drain Bellevue Hill, Vaucluse, the most powerful and uh, influential people uh, in Australia, nearly, you know, to within one kilometre of here. There are probably 60 to 70 percent of the homeless beds. It used to be mattresses, right? And from here, and if a kid runs away from home in the country, a kid uh, gets into trouble with drugs, to an adult or things, we have this totally socially disadvantaged drug within, once again, within one kilometre of St. Vincent's. Unfortunately, uh, the most depraved and unfortunate things that human beings do. He imbibe within one kilometre mm. here. So, and, uh, so we get this incredible mixture of social strata. Uh, on top of that, we have a heart transplant. We have the first hospital to care for HIV. Uh, a lot of hospitals didn't want them. Uh, we still are the main, one of the main HIV hospitals in Australia. And we do very clever stuff. We don't deliver babies unless they come in a taxi, and we don't do children. Okay. Uh, do you see a lot of young people admitted to the, the emergency department and what usually brings them here? Defining young is, as I said, we have a children's hospital, you know, five minutes really uh, drive from here. Um, but yes, we see anything 15 years and over. So the teenagers, the people who are trying drugs, the teenagers who are getting into trouble with alcohol, we see because it's the party precinct. Yeah. So we have heaps and heaps of uh, teenagers and we have the highest numbers and concentration of young people getting in trouble. Uh, so just a question on drugs and alcohol here. So how do drugs, alcohol and reckless behaviour negative, negatively affect young people between 16 and 24 years old? You've nearly answered the question thank you, by, the, by your question. Um, <laughs> the thing is, I think well, you've got to look at it a bit more ref reflective, why are young kids getting into trouble? 
every time a young kid gets into teenager, anybody, but especially young people, gets into strife, you know, uh, health, police, both, whatever, uh, that is bad, may affect your job prospects, all that sort of thing, let alone if there's a bad head injury because they've been run over, because they've been drunk or whatever it is and things, or got into a fight, all that sort of stuff. Uh, that is a tragedy, it affects so many other people. And the big thing is, it's preventable. It's mm -hmm. about an alcohol, it's about excess indulgence. Indulgence, obviously, a drunk 15 year old kid is there's something, I mean, there's something very wrong with that picture. Yes, that's right. Okay, so um, how do drugs, so how do drugs, reckless, drugs, alcohol, and reckless behavior affect uh, individuals and also their communities, both socially, economically, and physically? So, just a bit of a follow on question. Okay, the, the thing is, the uh, really the ripple effect, something happens, but it really affects everybody and everything. The very first is the, the patient themselves, the individual. Even in sport, no alcohol, no drugs, there's a lot more research going on about it, the concussion thing, bad tackle, etc., uh, etc., et hitting the ground, uh, getting hit by a cricket ball, whatever, uh, which is, you know, things that people play sport in school. Uh, you can have concussion, it can take six months for you to be right to concentrate, let alone if you had a big punch and you've lost consciousness, you know, uh, your personality changes, on that then your relationship to your loved ones, family, relationship to uh, work, concentration, all that sort of thing. It can be very, very subtle, but even the subtle ones are very devastating. And then as they get older, you know, what the inability to concentrate at work means you won't pass your exams, you won't get that promotion uh, and once again it's all because I'm saying nothing about people shouldn't have some drinks 18 it's legal uh, what I'm saying is excess drinking which is part of our culture uh, is devastating and it devastates right through they've costed the price of a serious head injury right at 12 million dollars and that a what we just talked about but that 12 million dollars could and should be spent on looking after other diseases, other health issues, treatment, prevention, all that sort of stuff. So uh, what trends have you seen in relation to drug and alcohol usage and popularity? So as in like popularity of different types of drugs used around the, in the community in this area? One of the things about, for instance, the emergency department here, we see the newest drugs as they come because there's the party zone, we've got the affluent eastern suburbs, you know, so cocaine, all those sort of things. Uh, we have all the party animals, the rave, the dances, all this sort of thing. And we pick up very early. There's something different here. Um, but to generalise, alcohol still is the biggest problem here by enormous. But Australia as a nation, one population from the United Nations, we're the world champion in amphetamine type substances, especially ecstasy. Nobody eats as much ecstasy. Australians do. Uh, we are um, third in the world for uh, crystal meth, fourth in the world for cocaine. And that's terrible. We've got the Olympics at the moment. Those are just podium finishes we really shouldn't have. Mm, that's right. Um, so what programs are there in place to help people with drug and alcohol problems and how effective do you believe they are? Once again, a very wide question. There are lots, right? Uh, and there's very effective once again, everybody likes a single line answer. Everybody wants to have a single silver bullet. The number of times parents bring me up, I see them, whatever, all those sort of answers. And there just isn't a single strategy. And each kid is different, each human being is different in the response. But uh, for some things, um, like alcohol, it's not that hard, right? I mean, that we can do stuff and you, whatever. Uh, crystal meth, ice, uh, treatment options and everything, uh, we're still le learning our way there. They're, they're not anywhere near we'd like them to be. Hmm. So if you suspect a friend who is developing a drug or alcohol problem, what is the best way to help them? Okay, this gets back to going back to the core, what's the problem here? Why, big question, why has this individual started taking drugs? Because most everybody knows it's maybe not a good idea, right? And um, and one of the big things, especially for younger people, is self-esteem, right? 
and uh, for self-esteem reasons, depression, for, or lack of self-esteem, depression and things, that's why alter reality, that's what alcohol does uh, in, in, in large amounts, and the thing is you lose control and uh, then it just like in, especially if Christian it spirals into really, really, really tragic situations. So the thing is if you have a friend and you have to be a friend, first of all, if somebody's getting drunk, be the true mate. We're supposed to be mates to each other. That's boys, girls, whatever the, the thing. That this is not a good look. If somebody's in trouble, they have drunk too much for whatever reason, right? Stay with them. Make sure try and convince them to go home, whatever. If you need help, come to a hospital. We really don't care if you're a 15 year old and you give us your false name. I don't care. We are here to look after you. Never tell the police. Never, ever, ever. Nobody. And, and, and you have the right uh, to say I don't want anybody who knows this. So that's, that's fine. Uh, and that should help a lot of people who you know, overdose with drugs and things like that. Uh, we'll help them. Because if we get a patient who's alive in an emergency department, Nearly everyone will let them go home alive, right? Mm -hmm. But if we get them and they're three quarters dead because people are frightened to bring them to the emergency department, yeah, some of those don't do well, and that is just so horrible. Uh, but going back to the thing, how do we do this? If you see your friend dropping down, basically the most important thing is to try and get the friend to see that they have a problem. Don't get very far with being a parent yelling at kids. You don't get very far if the patient themselves doesn't think there's a problem. No one's accepted because if they don't accept that, they're sure as hell not going to accept any treatment or thing, which is which takes a thing and takes you know patient cooperation. It could be counselling. It could be all sorts of things. Might have to see a psychiatrist. Well. They're not mad, but seeing a psychiatrist is not the thing you first thing you tell anybody you meet in the bus, you know. Um, so, but the very first thing is to get your friend to acknowledge and accept there is a problem, and then the battle's half won. Okay, Dr. Gordon Porter, thanks. Thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Okay.